Yeah, we came too far In the darkest days Don't know where we are But who we are Yeah, we came too far In the darkest days Don't know where we are But who we are Yeah, we came too far In the darkest days Don't know where we are But who we are Yeah, we came too far In the darkest days Alright, what up y'all? Planet of the Fakes and Pigstar HH News. Uh, you're looking at Garrett Foster and his fiance, Whitney. Now, it's a lot of controversy surrounding Garrett Foster based on the fact he was armed at a Black Lives Matter protest, protesting with Black Lives Matter. And right before he was shot and killed, he made a 40 second video someone asked him why he was out there with an AK-47 and he responded that the people that supposing Black Lives Matter matters are big P-U-Z-Z-I-E's and they'll never do anything about it but he also was saying that he carried the AK because they would no longer let them protest in the street yet he was protesting in the street not only that as soon as a protester is killed at a protest, people automatically believe the protester was in the right and the person that shot him was in the wrong. Now, I look at it like this. Yes, he had the right to have his AK on him, but why would you want to be in a crowd of unarmed people armed? It's nothing for them to take your gun knock you out and take your gun but not only that as soon as some chaos begins and say shooting start just because you armed you may be looked at as a suspect not only that my opinion on it is basically he sh he looked like he was trying to police a situation and he wasn't police what had happened was a car was headed towards the protesters and like many of people, um, Garrett may have approached the car with his rifle. Now, it's controversy between whether he pointed the rifle at the driver of the car or if he had it pointed down. There are pictures circulating of Garrett pointing the weapon down. Let me see if I can find that. All right, so this is the picture they have circulating and as you can see in the red box that's Garrett with his weapon pointed down and look he's approaching the driver's side why I don't know and that's what I considered policing you know what I mean he's not police so the last place he should have been was confronting someone doing wrong in the protest I thought the weapon was to protect you. And if he wasn't in any danger, I don't see why he engaged his driver. And yes, the weapon's pointed down in that picture. It only takes a little bit of tilt of the arm to have it pointed at a driver. Now, the controversy is this. They're saying Garrett never pointed it at him. And the driver just, I guess, came out the car and started firing or started firing people cleared the car and they drove off he later called the police and said he shot a protester the controversy also comes from their claiming he provoked the attack by driving towards protesters but they're also claiming that stand your ground may protect him based on the fact you can see his car being mobbed by people you know what i'm saying and not only that one of them is armed. So does, did it really take someone aiming a gun at him once he's seen a gun and all these people rushing his car? That's threatening. And based on that castle law, if you feel your life is threatened, you can open fire. And it's not like he shot an unarmed person. So when police got there, they seen a man with an AK-47 laid down needing life-saving techniques done on him. But also, there's rumors that his girlfriend was killed as well. She was pushed out the wheelchair and trampled. 
I can't find no evidence of that. And that's what I was looking for. Also, they're trying to say that him and Whitney were married. It's my understanding that he was her caretaker, being a quadriplegian and all. She lost her legs. I don't know if it came from military service or not, but he was her caretaker for 10 years. And they're claiming it's his girlfriend slash fiance. I say this, you in a relationship for 10 years and you ain't marry her. Just a little side eye on that. But I want y'all to check out this video compilation. Let me know. Was Garrett in the wrong for being armed at a Black Lives Matter protest? And they're also saying the fact that he came to armed where it's supposed to be peaceful, he kind of provoked it on himself. You understand that? I'm in the middle. I don't think you should be armed in a crowd of unarmed people. It's a recipe for disaster. Also, protests with weapons. It's, gonna, it's only a matter of time before people start to crack with weapons, you know what I mean? And protests and police tear gassing and things like that. But we got the videos here. Check them out. You're going to see crowds running and things like that. These videos are on YouTube, so this disclaimer is to YouTube. Don't remove my video and not remove all the videos of this scene, and that's that. But check it out, and if anybody have any information on Whitney, his girlfriend, put it in the comments. Because I seen no evidence that she was harmed, nor have, I, nor have I seen her come and speak out publicly. And to these protesters, don't ride so hard for Black Lives Matter. You put yourself in situations like this or similar. And people, seeing people protest don't drive your car towards them because if they had guns and you was driving towards them, you're threatening their life. Do they have the right to open fire on you? And again, they said his weapon was pointed at the car. They got a steel frame but that the weapon wasn't. And there's also video. So look close at the video. You may be able to see if he did or if he didn't. With that being said, what you heard and saw was the content. For additional content, click the link in the description. Like, follow, share, subscribe, comment. Hit the bell, visit my community wall. And if you have time, go to www.amore-eka.com backslash TV. That's our Planet of the Fakes, too. We are the new umbrella. Planet of, Planet of the Fakes and Pig Star HH News. BLM protester fatally shot in Austin, people who hate use are too big of PCs to actually do anything about it. Garrett Foster, the Black Lives Matter protester fatally shot by a motorist in Austin on Saturday night said on camera that the people who hate us are too big of PCs to actually do anything about it when asked why he was carrying a rifle. The Austin police said during a late night press conference that Foster was carrying a rifle and may have approached the vehicle prior to the shooting. The shooter was detained and is cooperating with police. One adult male victim was located with a gunshot wound, the press officer said, before confirming he passed away at the hospital shortly after. Initial reports indicate that the victim may have been carrying a rifle and approached the suspect vehicle. Suspect was in the vehicle and shot at the victim. Suspect was detained and is cooperating with officers. In an interview with a live streamer, Foster was asked about what he was carrying, to which he responded that it was an AK-47. They don't let us march in the streets anymore, so I got to practice some of our rights, he responded. The interview then asked if he felt like he would need to use it. Is it okay to say, all lives matter? Ye. Nah, he responded. I mean, if I use it against the cops I'm dead. I think all the people that hate us and want to say shit to us are too big of PCs to stop and actually do anything about it. When asked why he started carrying, he said that it was because his roommate got arrested and they wouldn't let us march anywhere. The incident was captured on Facebook Live. It appeared that the crowd was blocking traffic and possibly surrounding the car prior to the shooting. Someone got out of their car and shot one of the protesters, the live streamer said. The man who was live streaming, Hiram Gilberto, wrote in a follow-up Facebook post that, I was no more 10 feet from the shooter and running towards his car. It was too close. Currently on my way to give a witness statement to APD. Keep those affected in your thoughts. Full video link in the description. Like, follow, share, subscribe and comment hit the bell. And, if, you, have, time, thank you very 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 much. Go to, www.
They don't let us march in the streets anymore, so got to practice some some of our rights. No, I think the. Uh, I mean, if I use it against the cops, I'm dead. And I think all the people that hate us and you know want to say shit to us are too big of uh, pussies to stop and actually do anything about it. So. Why'd you start carrying? Well, our roommate got arrested and they stopped letting us march anywhere, so started carrying. <laughs> Planet of the Fakes and Pig Star HH News. Trigger warning, murder. Garrett Foster was murdered last night peacefully protesting at a Black Lives Matter protest in Austin, Texas with his fiancée, Whitney, who is a quadruple amputee because of serious medical negligence. She was thrown off her wheelchair and he was shot three times. Say his name great man. I'm so sorry for your loss. Garrett's name, unfortunately, will be added to the list of martyrs that have lost their lives fighting peacefully for righteousness. Exclamation mark exclamation mark. Garrett Foster. Regina Joseph people laugh because of the couple. He's white, she's black. She's an amputee and he's not but he was very much in love with her. It's generally haters laughing, are complete idiots. Just ignore them. People always wanna be mean. Everyone laughing are rednecks, Fabian Antonio Rubio no dip ship, he stated that all the counter-protesters were pussy, then he proceeded to point his weapon at a counter-protester and found out he was the pussy. Yes he stated that on public TV, it is on tape and he was recorded approaching the car that was surrounded and pointing his weapon at the driver, never point your weapon unless you plan to use it, William Cosmo 100% agree never point your weapon and play games win stupid prize. But why laugh at someone dead? Fabian Antonio Rubio I'm not laughing. They might be laughing at the irony of his remarks that he was against pussies but found himself a lion instead, Michelle Skutnik no they laugh because he was the aggressor and put his life in his own hands when he aimed his AK-47 at the vehicle that was being accosted by protesters and was shot while the driver was defending themselves. They do separate volleys of gunfire in the area of the protest. Austin 911 also received multiple calls of shots fired in the 300 block of Congress Avenue. Officers working the protest immediately moved up and observed Mr. Foster with multiple gunshot wounds. Austin police officers began resuscitation efforts and Austin fire arrived on scene. Mr. Foster's rifle. Everyone involved. A criminal law professor at St. Mary's University in San Antonio says that's due to the state's gun laws. Under Texas law, about the only thing you have to do is uh, show you had a right to be present at a particular place with your gun and uh, then you reasonably felt threatened. On Saturday, Foster was openly carrying an AK-47 style rifle, which is legal in Texas. The driver told police Foster aimed the weapon directly at him. Witnesses say that's not true, but Colton says that might not matter, as long as the driver says he was acting in self-defense. If he's frightened, you're gonna have you're gonna have a guy pulling a gun and shooting. We've had people shoot for a lot less here in the state of Texas. And it's very difficult for a prosecutor to win these self-defense cases of these kind. It's less than one percent in the state of Texas. That's because of Texas gun laws, including the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground. But by 1995, the Castle Doctrine was uh, well established by the legislature, which essentially said a homeowner uh, felt threatened or somebody on their property felt threatened. They could use a gun to defend themselves. I think it was about 2007 that uh, the Stand Your Ground law went into effect. You didn't have to be on your property to uh, use the self-defense logic to uh, shoot another person. Witnesses argue the driver instigated the situation by deliberately driving into the crowd of protesters. While Colton says there might be a case there... That's going to be very hard to prove. The question is, who provoked him? And the question is, does he have a right to be with his vehicle in that location? Colton says Foster had the right to openly carry his weapon, but due to stand your ground law, the driver had the right to feel threatened by it and shoot. Texans support people's uh, right to uh, stand their ground. You're setting yourself up uh, if you have a gun to take on anybody. It's just a, a very difficult situation in a heavily uh, crowded gun culture. Nikki Griswold, Spectrum News.
Planet of the Fakes 4 Families, and Pig Star HH News. Who is Sheila Foster, Garrett Foster, Mother Interview, Wiki, Biography, Age, Twitter Video, Hidden Facts You Need to Know. Sheila Foster Wiki, Sheila Foster Biography. Sheila Foster is the mother of Garrett Foster who was shot to death in Austin during peaceful protest of Black Lives Matters. Sheila Foster says son was pushing fiancé's wheelchair before shooting. Who is Sheila Foster and what she says about her son? Garrett Foster's mother, who was killed during an Austin protest, spoke to, Good Morning America. She said that she had participated in many peaceful protests with her fiancé, Whitney Mitchell, a foursome of four. Sheila Foster said her son pushed Mitchell's wheelchair moments before shooting. GMA, spoke to victim's mother Sheila Foster, who explained what was happening differently. And this gentleman got out of her car and started shooting, and my son was shot three times, she said. Sheila Foster interview video. KVUE's Good Morning America colleagues interviewed Sheila Foster on Sunday morning, she says her son Garrett Foster is the murdered man, she said that she and her fiancé had been participating in the protests for quite some time and were in the city center on Saturday night. In a video posted on social media shot by journalist Hiram Gilberto, multiple gunshots were heard, as at the intersection where the incident took place. On Sunday morning, several candidates up for elections in November spoke out about the shooting on Twitter. Austin City Council member tweet about the shooting incident in Austin. Austin City Council member Greg Kassar also tweeted about the shooting Sunday, saying that she is pressing for all the information about what happened to be made public but that, at this moment, she doesn't know more than what is in the news. Full video link in the description. Like, follow, share, subscribe and comment hit the bell. And if you have time, thank you very 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 much. Go to www.amore- Son and his fiance were participating in a protest in downtown Austin. And um, I got a friend reach out via Facebook asking me to call. It was Whitney's mother. And when I called, she told me he'd been shot. They've been participating in these protests almost every day for the past 50 days. Um, I talked to him two days ago and I was texting him yesterday. I didn't get to talk to him today. He has actually told me that they were extremely peaceful and that he hadn't experienced any of the, the negative stuff that, that we're seeing sometimes on the media. He um, was doing it because he feels really strongly about justice and he's very heavily against police brutality and he wanted to support um, his fiance. His fiance is an African-American They've been together since they were 17 years old. And he um, just felt really strongly about the justice of, the, of everything. Um, it wouldn't surprise me because he does have a license to carry and he would have felt the need to protect himself. Some of these things that we have seen on the media have tended to go a little um, violently. From what I'm being told, um, and it was a chaotic situation, there were relatively a thousand people at this protest and someone was driving erratically through the crowd. People were getting out of the way and telling this gentleman to slow down and telling him to, to stop driving because he was at risk of hitting someone. Um, and from what I'm understanding, 
Garrett was pushing Whitney through an intersection and this gentleman got out of his car and started firing shots and my son was shot three times. It's messed up, man. Thankfully, Whitney was not hurt. Whitney wasn't hurt, y'all. Hey there, Facebook, Mike Baroud here from KVU News. Uh, I am social distancing right now, so I'm gonna keep my mask off for the time being. But right now I'm downtown Austin where there have been a lot of protests happening. Uh, we were out here live at five o'clock and six o'clock here on KVU. And basically, just wanted to give you a quick update. There have been uh, some people detained at this protest. Uh, this is the one that's at the Garrett Foster Memorial here at 4th Street and Congress Avenue. Uh, I'm gonna flip the camera around, kind of show you what we're looking at. We're, we're pretty far away, we wanna keep our distance, uh, but I'm just gonna flip the camera around. So, just to zoom in a little bit, there are quite a few people here. Police did block off Congress Avenue uh, to make sure people are not walking or driving down the middle of the street. There you can kind of see that it's pretty empty right now. And there are a lot of megaphones uh, leading chants on the protesting side, as well as, um, you know, really, I guess, commands coming from Austin police, making sure that uh, originally that people were staying on the sidewalk. Uh, at one point, they were also calling on people to stay uh, on the sidewalk and, you know, make sure not to block the crosswalks. And I apologize in advance if there's any profanity uh, in this video. Uh, again, these are protests that are happening right here in downtown Austin. Again, this is about a week after uh, Garrett Foster's death uh, last Saturday evening. And uh, a lot of these protesters have come armed. And now, some of them are actual protesters. Others are groups who have come to protect the protesters. There's also another group here to make sure that people stay safe in general. Uh, so I talked to quite a few of those people. We'll hear from them tonight on KV News at 10. Uh, and a lot of people, some of the people that came armed to protect the protesters uh, are not necessarily just from Austin. We talked to some people from Dallas, uh, other cities here in Texas. Uh, but again, most of the people here are from Austin or the uh, surrounding towns. And uh, right now, it's it's been pretty peaceful uh, for the past maybe 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, we did see Austin police come through with mounted patrol units uh, to kind of break up the crowd a little bit. We've also seen this crowd march north towards the Capitol, uh, kind of get cut off by police uh, in the crosswalks whenever the light would turn red. Uh, but now it's gotten to the point where police are not breaking them up in terms of uh, using the crosswalk. Uh, but they're, you know, the protesters have been marching up and down Congress Avenue for the past few hours. Uh, and from it seems like it's going to be uh, a lot longer as well. That, you know, that this is still a lot of energy here uh, in downtown right on Congress Avenue. So, again, this is right by the Garrett Foster Memorial. We did learn uh, the other day that Daniel Perry is the one who came forward saying he shot and killed Foster after he says... Foster aimed an AK-47 at him. Uh, police are still investigating the incident, and a lot of the people out here this evening are calling for, of course, uh, racial equality, but also justice for Garrett Foster. They want to see somebody taken into custody and arrested uh, for Foster's death. But again, police are still investigating. So it looks like the crowd is steadily moving down Congress Avenue, not going anywhere too fast or anything like that. Uh, and I apologize, I'm not really able to see the comments here, but uh, 
this has been going on since the protesters arrived really around like 6 30 ish um, yeah, six o'clock six six maybe six fifteen uh, there's also a, you know a few other groups here like I said there were some that were uh, armed demonstrators down at Austin Police Department who were going to be marching with this group as well as uh, another group that you heard uh, from Bryce Newberry earlier. He was uh, coming live from a march to amplify black voices that was marching from uh, University of Texas Tower uh, over to City Council member Kathy Tovo's house. So he was up there and some of the armed uh, protest Protecting protection group uh, was with them. Uh, now we did also see a post from the uh, organizers of that march that they that it was a uh, they did not want the armed protection, uh, thinking it would invite challenge. Uh, however, this protest here downtown has not called for that. It looks like uh, there are some officers now with shields. You can see it there. I apologize for the poor quality. We're pretty far away. But again, we're trying to keep our distance from all this uh, just to, to be safe here. And it looks like uh, they are lining up in the street. This might be uh, Texas DPS. Uh, they, were, they announced just the other day that they are working with Austin Police Department as well as the National Guard after hearing, quote, credible tips that uh, there would be people trying to disrupt these peaceful protests this evening. Uh, so again, Texas DPS is here now. You can see Austin police, of course, here. Uh, and they've both been um, consulting at the very least with the National Guard, according to Texas DPS. Uh, I'm gonna zoom it out again so we can get better video overall. Uh, we've seen uh, a, at least two helicopters overhead this evening. Uh, a handful of drones as well, getting video of everything. Uh, we've seen a lot of people actually taken into custody and uh, police warned protesters that their signs were blocking the crosswalk, which they were not allowed to do. Minutes later, police came and uh, detained some of those protesters who were uh, blocking the crosswalk, blocking the sidewalk, uh, near the Garrett Foster Memorial. Uh, in some cases, using pepper spray, we actually had uh, one of my colleagues uh, kind of get secondhand pepper spray. It wasn't directly spray, but it was next to somebody who did, or who was, excuse me. It looks like uh, the DPS line is now moving out of the intersection of 4th and Congress. Well, moving down a little bit, I suppose. Uh, you can still see a lot of protesters standing in the roadway with signs visible uh, we have not seen any sort of like bottle throwing or anything like that from protesters so far this evening. Uh, we did see one person kind of underhand toss uh, a couple handfuls of pebbles at the bike, uh, excuse me, the cyclist officer, excuse me, cyclist officers, um, and she was taken into custody. And that's uh, when some of those arrests were taking place, or I should say detainments were taking place um, earlier this evening, right around seven o'clock or so. Uh, so we're gonna cross the street here. I guess we can just, yeah, we can just cross the street itself, kind of get a different angle. Uh, we're also gonna start getting set up for our 10 p.m. Uh, live shots here right downtown. Um, for our 10 o'clock newscast. So I am gonna have to cut off this stream in a few minutes, unfortunately. I, I know that this is uh, very valuable to those who are not able to be out here tonight. We do, of course, wanna bring you as much up-to-date and accurate information as we can. Uh, make sure to, you know, we're, we're also posting pictures and videos on our social media pages, right here on Facebook, Twitter, uh, on YouTube as well. Um, I'm gonna move over to the curb see what we can get it looks like DPS officers are, are making sure that people are not standing in the street uh, on the south side of 4th Street again between 4th and 3rd here on Congress Avenue um, and it looks like there are still some people over at the memorial 
which is right at 4th and Congress. And officers are keeping uh, everyone on the sidewalks for the most part. Of course, you can see some people in the roadway here um, on the north side of 4th Street. We're going to move a little bit forward kind of get a different angle here from the roadway again while staying safe we, we don't want to jump in the middle or anything like that we're just trying to you know bring a good angle here a, a video so everyone can kind of see what's going on now officers do have again congress avenue blocked off from third street all the way down to about ninth or tenth streets maybe even 11th actually now that i'm looking that way again you can kind of see all these uh, dps officers here now uh, again we've talked to many people here who came armed um, with their own weapons many of them all of them saying uh, that we talked to anyway that saying that they are here to you know make sure that nobody gets hurt um, and making sure that these protests this evening are as peaceful as possible. Oh, there you go. So. Look behind you. Other way. To your right, to your right, to your right. To your right. Sorry about that. I had to uh, take a call. Take a call there from uh, my colleague, Bryce Newberry, who's arrived on scene as well. So, we're going to have to uh, cut off the stream here in about three minutes or so, uh, so that way we can set up for our 10 p.m. live uh, live shots again here on KBU. But we'll be out here for uh, at least a few more hours uh, covering these protests, so make sure to keep following us here on Facebook, Twitter, uh, on YouTube as well. We'll be trying to bring you as many videos and, and scene footage as we can, as well as trying to uh, interview people who we can, too. Uh, interviews have been pretty hard to come by uh, during this time, really, from everybody here. Uh, law enforcement, you know, only certain people are allowed to speak to us. Uh, protesters have been hesitant. But again, there are quite a few people out this evening. And DPS officers kind of blocking off the roadway here along with Austin police. <laughs> so like I said, there are a couple of helicopters up top. There's one there and there's one above us there as well as uh, some drones.
All right, guys, we are going to have to uh, cut off the live stream for now so we can get set up for our newscast at 10 p.m. But uh, make sure, again, to follow us here on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. We'll be uh, putting as many videos as we can up here on social media. Hey there, Facebook. Mike Baroud here from KVU News. Uh, I am social distancing right now, so I'm going to keep my mask off for the time being. But right now, I'm down. Two separate volleys of gunfire in the area of the protest. Austin 911 also received multiple calls of shots fired in the 300 block of Congress Avenue. Officers working the protest immediately moved up and observed Mr. Foster with multiple gunshot wounds. Austin police officers began resuscitation efforts and Austin fire arrived on scene and continued these efforts. Austin Travis County EMS transported Mr. Foster to Dale Seton Medical Center where he succumbed to his wounds and was pronounced deceased at 10.25 p.m. Among the callers to Austin 911 was a subject who stated they had just been involved in a shooting and driven away from the scene. The caller stated they had shot someone who had approached the driver's window of their vehicle and pointed a rifle at them. The caller was instructed to pull over and officers would be dispatched. Officers located and brought the caller to the homicide office to be interviewed. The handgun and vehicle were secured as evidence. At the scene of the shootings, officers spoke with multiple witnesses that described several different versions of the incident. Witnesses reported a disturbance began when a vehicle started honking its horn as it turned southbound onto Congress from 4th Street. The vehicle stopped as there were a large number of people in the roadway. Mr. Foster, who was holding an AK-47 type assault rifle, approached the driver's side window as others in the crowd began striking the vehicle. Gunshots were fired from inside the vehicle at Mr. Foster. During the initial investigation of this incident, it appears that Mr. Foster may have pointed his weapon at the driver of this vehicle prior to being shot. After the first volley of gunfire, another individual reported hearing the gunshots and observed the vehicle driving away from the crowd. This individual drew their concealed handgun and fired multiple shots at the vehicle as it drove away. That subject was also brought to the homicide office to be interviewed. Mr. Foster's rifle and this subject's handgun were also secured as evidence. Homicide detectives and crime scene specialists arrived to process the scene. Detectives are reviewing available video, photos, and witness statements to determine the precise actions of those involved. Our investigators consulted through the night with the Travis County District Attorney's Office and will continue to coordinate this investigation with them. Both individuals have been released pending further investigation, and both individuals did possess a concealed handgun license. The Travis County Medical Examiner's Office will be conducting an autopsy to determine the official cause and manner of death. It is important that the community come forward and help us with this investigation. And as such, our detectives are asking anyone with video or photos of this incident to call APD Homicide at 512-974-TIPS, the Crime Stoppers Anonymous tip line at 512-472-8477, or to use the new Crime Stoppers app or email APD Homicide at homicide.apd at austintexas.gov. You may remain anonymous, and you can also submit tips by downloading APD's mobile app on iPhone and Android. It is very important if you have video, if you have pictures, if you have information, that you come forward and provide that to us so that that will be included in this ongoing investigation. I want to take a moment to highlight the actions of our officers last night. Yet again, the men and women of the Austin Police Department ran towards danger. As soon as the shots were fired, our officers were working their way through the crowd, finding the victim and providing life-saving measures. Regardless of the incident, regardless of the crowd, our officers each day show up 
and they put their lives on the line helping others. And that's what happened last night. Regardless of the topic of the protest, whether the protest is geared at these officers, whether they were earlier in the evening taking insults from these individuals, these officers put all of that aside as they do every single day, and they ran towards the danger and helped this individual, but unfortunately were unable to save his life. And that is the work that the men and women of the Austin Police Department do day in and day out that so often goes unnoticed. And I wanna highlight this again, because in these difficult times, as we're all working to try and improve relationships, I do think it's important to highlight the great work that the men and women of APD are doing, even under these very difficult circumstances. They were present throughout the evening. They were actually following this march and were in a position, as I said earlier, when the shots rang out, to immediately respond. One of the difficulties is a new tactic that we've noticed some of the protest marches are using is putting vehicles behind the marching uh, protesters to keep officers further back or to interfere with officers that may be trying to reach the crowd. Although it didn't create a significant delay last night when the shots rang out and the vehicle that was monitoring and following the march tried to move up to uh, get involved one of the vehicles that was trailing the protest ended up blocking them and getting in the way for a brief moment and slowed down their response. So again, our officers are doing everything we can do to allow these protests, to allow these marches to take place and to do so in a way that is as safe as possible and let people exercise their right to free speech. But we need everyone involved to help us in this endeavor. This is the 28th homicide in Austin this year, an increase of well over 70% in the homicide rate this year. Our aggravated assaults are up 14% and our robberies are up 16%. We are seeing a significant increase in violent crime this year. And this is very important as we engage in community conversations about policing and the future of policing, that we ensure that we do keep in mind that one of the key functions of a police department is the safety of our community and combating violent crime. And even at our current staffing levels, we're facing significant challenges in this area. So again, we are heartbroken over the loss of Mr. Foster last night. It is actively being investigated and uh, ongoing in conjunction with the Travis County District Attorney's Office. That is the information that we have at this preliminary point in the investigation. And I'm going to open it up for questions here in a moment. But as is typical, there's probably not a lot of additional information we can put out at this point since we are still only 24 hours into this investigation, roughly. Um, so with that, I will open it up for any questions. Chief, Chief, it's Tony Plahetsky here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Tony. Uh, so, so people are just still a little hazy about this, and so I want to try to help clear it up, is the indication that the man in the car was the first person to fire a weapon? Based on what we know right now, that is what we believe. We believe that as he turned on to Congress Avenue, and as you can see in the videos, as the crowd surrounds his vehicle, and as uh, some of the protesters are striking his vehicle, his account is that Mr. Foster pointed the weapon directly at him and he fired his handgun at Mr. Foster. Thank you. Tony, can you mute your mic, please? Oh, sorry. Tahara with KXAN. I was wondering, do you have a rough estimate of how many officers were on the ground last night just monitoring the protests? That is information we can get you in a follow-up question. Depending upon the night of the week and the events that we anticipate based on what we see on social media or that we're made aware of, we adjust our scheduling for that. I do know last night we had the Mounted Patrol, which is a critical element in the Austin Police Department for crowd control endeavors, along with Metro Tactical Teams and downtown officers that were monitoring these activities, but and our special response team as well for a spe specific number that we have to follow up with you. 
This is uh, Danny Davis with the Austin American Statesman. Is there any indication about what the car was doing in the first place? Was it trying to get around? Was it trying to drive into the protests? Is there any indication about the car itself? That information is specific to the investigation, and we're not going to release anything that the driver told us at this point about why he was there and what he was doing. I think everyone has probably seen the video that's circulating on social media that actually shows and make that turn onto Congress and uh, pull into that crowd and then immediately be surrounded by it. Is the suspect in custody or was he ever taken into custody? Both individuals that fired weapons last night were detained, brought to police headquarters and interviewed by homicide detectives. And again, in consultation and working with the Travis County District Attorney's Office, after speaking to both of them, they've been released at this point pending the further investigation. I'll leave it open for another 15 seconds to make sure there's not another question, and then we'll uh, shut down. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chief. Two separate volleys of gunfire in the area of the protest. Austin 911 also received multiple calls of shots fired in the 300 block of Congress Avenue. Officers working the protest immediately moved up and observed Mr. Foster with multiple gunshot wounds. Austin police officers began resuscitation efforts and Austin fire arrived on scene and continued these efforts. Austin Travis County EMS I'm going to say this again about Garrett Foster. He was a United States veteran. He was an American citizen. He was a libertarian. He was a human being who deserved and had the right to protect himself and protect his quadriplegic fiance. He was pushing in the street while they were simply demonstrating for the rights of other African Americans or other American citizens. Whatever you need to do to dehumanize these people as Antifa, BLM, or whatever you want to say about the organization is your right to say. But your inability to see these citizens as that, as citizens, says more about your standing than theirs. Dehumanizing other people is a tactic of white supremacy. It's a tactic of all supremacists to now label the other side as something other than human beings. Label them as something other than United States citizens. It's disgusting. And I'm going to say that right out. Yes, I support BLM as an organization and as a movement to hit me with this Antifa terrorism shit is utterly ridiculous. And I say that because where is your stance against the racist terrorism that we have been seeing in these United States all of my adult life, my childhood my mother's adult life, my mother's childhood, my grandmother's adult life, my grandmother's childhood, my great grandmother, my great 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 great, and on and on. So again, what we see are American citizens protesting for a change in policy, nothing more. 
to try and call them terrorists or something other than citizens is your disgusting perspective. And again, here's a video to demonstrate that the car drove erratically into the crowd that killed Garrett Forrest. You have no evidence of your dislike of this murdered United States veteran. You have nothing but your assumptions. And your assumptions are based on the type of media that you are listening to. Your assumptions are being reinforced by that same media. All you're learning about is why men are bad if you're a woman, uh, why white people are bad if you're uh, a black person or a white person. They now have classes where white people have to learn about their white guilt. And what we've really done is we replaced a solid education system with psychological conditioning, right? These kids come out of school, they hate the West. They think there's something fundamentally wrong and backwards about capitalism, about Western society. And yet, if you speak to any of those people that speak so negatively about America, they'd never want to go live anywhere in the East. Why, why do you want to live in the West? You know, why would you prefer your kids grow up here as opposed to growing up somewhere like Russia? Um, and, and this is sort of the problem that we have is that we're fundamentally teaching anti-Americanism. And I feel badly when I see these kids like these, you know, 15 year old Antifa thugs, right? Running around rioting because they really know nothing. They know nothing. Chaos in America, violent clashes erupting across the country. One person shot and killed at a Black Lives Matter protest in Austin, Texas. The suspect is now in custody. I mean, the guy that lost his life, he went out there with his uh, rifle. Yeah. I mean, that's his right. That's his yeah. Second Amendment right. Yeah. Right? And but, I support that. And I support that. But when you involve yourself in a group of people yeah. who's not being peaceful, who are disturbing the peace, yeah. who's impeding traffic, right? And then the driver of the vehicle claims that he pointed the rifle at him. What yeah. do you think's going to happen? Yeah. What in the Joe Biden do you think's going to happen? <laughs> a man carrying a rifle during a Black Lives Matter protest impeding traffic takes his rifle to a protest. He's not using that rifle to, you know, show everybody I'm practicing my Second Amendment right. No. He took that rifle there for one reason, to intimidate people. Yeah, that's and how... And I do not condone that. Yeah, and that's the way that driver of that car is going to take that. Yeah. He's been... He's surrounded by hundreds of people. People are trying to get in his car, right? And and then they point the rifle in the car. That's intimidating. He feared for his life. Yeah. There's a BLM event out there in Austin. And of course, they're blocking the streets as usual. A driver is just trying to get through the crowd to get from point A to point B. And he happens upon this little blockade. He's honking his horn. He's not driving through him. He's stopping, he has his brake lights on, he's trying to just get through and, you know, get to his destination. All of a sudden, he's been surrounded by all these people. And the guy who got shot, Garrett Foster, had his rifle pointed at the car. Problems, and we refuse to address any of them, which is why I just find the Black Lives Matter movement to just be rooted in fraud and, and it, it just a lack of courage, complete cowardice. I would support that movement in a second if they were talking about what we're talking about. If they were talking about black on black thing. crime, if they were talking about abortion, if they were talking about father absence, I'd be like, this is yes, finally we are having a real discussion with ourselves. <laughs>
Someone got out of their car and shot one of the protesters. Uh, do you want to do you want to sit on camera? Go for it. A car drove up. We were taking the streets, and he shot Garrett. Garrett is the husband of Whitney, a quadriplegic in a wheelchair, and he is her caretaker and has been for like ten years. I think he pointed the gun at her. <laughs> The media are treating Garrett Foster as some kind of um, victim or martyr. He's like a media darling right now. The New York Times are trying to paint the guy that got shot, Garrett Foster, as some kind of victim, talking about, oh, he really just enjoyed practicing Second Amendment rights, First Amendment rights, and that was cut short. The driver was threatening the people outside, the so-called protesters with his car, and he was violent, all this and that. But that's just not the reality Washington Post what was the title of the article I got it right here man What's the title of the Washington Post article? You ain't gonna believe this, everybody. Look, this is how the Washington Post is twisting this. An armed Black Lives Matter protester confronted a car that drove towards a march. <laughs> the driver fairly shot him. Yeah. I mean, that's 100% accurate, but you're lying by omission. Yeah. You left out very vital, important details. Y'all made facts. Y'all made it sound like he drove up on the sidewalk or something. These people impeding traffic in an intersection. He this man took a rifle to a protest and pointed at somebody in that car yeah. when people trying to jump in his car. America accepted the bait, right? So we are always the bait. Um, we are the bait that is used by leftists um, to further their, their goals. And their goals are to uh, attack the administration. They have been unrelentless in that pursuit over the last three and a half years. Um, so they see an instance in which Black America is upset, rightfully upset about George Floyd, and maybe they're going to come out and protest, right? And then they say, this is the opportunity for us uh, to now pretend that this is Black America, and it, it's them that's going to riot, right. and it's them that's going to loot. So right. Actually, using Black Americans as a shield um, uh, uh, to uh, pursue their an their anarchy, you know, their their anarchy goals, and um, in that way, it's extremely racist, right? To hide behind Black Americans and make us look like we're the criminals and we're the people that don't know how to cope with death, so we're burning down our neighborhoods. Uh, that's pretty ridiculous. Then you're gonna say Trump incited the violence by sending in federal troops? It's Trump's fault. It's Trump's fault. That's why people are burning down their own cities, because he's going to send federal police officers there. It's his fault. He's trying to regain law and order. It's not Trump's fault. He's sitting at home drinking wine and eating cheese on crackers. <laughs> he's trying to stop this. It's his fault. The That's the way you're painting things. Yeah, the fault belongs to the rioters. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, AK-47. Uh, Why would you got it out tonight? They don't let us march in the streets anymore, so got to practice some some of our rights. Do you feel like you will need to use it? Nah, I think the, uh, I mean, if I use it against the cops, I'm dead. And I think all the people that hate us and, you know, want to say shit to us are too big of a... Uh, to stop and actually do anything about it. So. Yeah. Why'd you start carrying? Well, our roommate got arrested and they stopped letting us march anywhere, so started carrying. Thanks. Apparently, he was wrong about that. Apparently, somebody will do something, as the great Ilhan Omar would say, and now he's dead. So it is what it is, man. You know what? I think these people need to stop because you're going to find people that are not just going to be victims. I'm not going to just sit there in my car and let you just do whatever you want to me, open my door, point your gun, maybe even shoot me and kill me. I mean, we've seen that happen. Officers were on scene in the 300 block of Congress Avenue, monitoring protesters when shots were fired. One adult male victim was located with a gunshot wound. That victim was transported to Del Seton, but was pronounced deceased shortly thereafter. Initial reports indicate the victim may have been carrying a rifle and approached suspect vehicle. 
Suspect was in the vehicle and shot at the victim. Suspect was detained and is cooperating with officers. Detectives and crime scene are on scene. There is no longer a threat to the public and no one else has been reported injured. Thank you guys. These people out there got to stop. Stop blocking traffic. Stop pointing your gun at people for no reason. Just stop it. You need to go home. You're not actually solving anything with this, okay? Why are you out there for two months straight in Portland? What have you actually gotten accomplished other than making your city more dangerous? Other than getting some kind of federal charge for shining a laser pointer in somebody's eyes, trying to blind them or trying to attack somebody? What have you actually gotten accomplished? I see no progress at all. People on the ground now for Black Lives Matter, the organization, or they're getting plenty of money. You say Black Lives Matter is what? Is a, a political arm for the Democratic Party. That has been co-opted. Correct. No one were recording. All right, so today we are going to talk about uh, the most divisive issue right now, the latest most divisive issue that's sweeping through libertarian circles. I mean, we can't get away from the divisiveness, it seems, in part politics these days, and uh, the Libertarian Party is no different. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's, it's almost worse because if there's one thing a libertarian can't stand more than a liberal and a conservative, it's another libertarian uh, with a slightly different opinion than them. We focus on our, our differences. Uh, last night, I got some uh, a, a kind of a panicked uh, message from one of our uh, Facebook communications people who had done a post about this guy, Garrett Foster, who uh, got gunned down in Austin at a Black Lives Matter uh, rally, who also happened to be a Libertarian Party member and a uh, pretty active member, I guess. And um, he got a lot of heat for it um, and, and was kind of panicking about what to do. And I'm like, yeah, dude, um, I, I get where your heart's at, but we, you know, with divisive issues like this, uh, one l social media post doesn't, properly address it. So I thought, you so know what, what let's just do about, well, it was about this guy, Garrett Foster, and it was very sympathetic to him. Right. And so right now, now for, for our audience, David has not heard of, <laughs> of this Garrett Foster because he lives in a little bubble, a self insulated bubble. And in a lot of ways I feel jealous because, you know, he's just off in his own thoughts, building his own empire. You know, the rest of the world's doing their crazy crap and he's, Rob, you know, hidden away from it in his fortress of solitude there. Um, so I, I'm going to have to explain to David uh, what happened. So, so basically uh, there was a car that was uh, driving into a crowd of uh, BLM protesters and, um, and, and, you know, something happened. The crowd became upset. This guy, Garrett Foster, who was packing an AK-47 at the time, uh, approached the car and uh, the the driver of the car fired at him five times and killed him. And then someone, one of Garrett's friends, I guess, fired back at the car as it was fleeing the scene. Um, and so now this has divided the political community and the libertarian community in, in half, right? Because of course we have to pick our tribes. So one tribe says Garrett Foster is a hero uh, who is standing up for black lives and protecting people. Uh, the other tribe says he was the villain and this, this uh, uh, car driver was, was the victim uh, and he was just defending himself and Garrett Foster is a terrible person for being involved with this Marxist organization and threatening them. And, and of course, there's misinformation on both sides. You know, the tribe that hates Garrett Foster said that he fired five shots first, right? Because gunnies that watched the video uh, heard five shots and they sounded like AK-47. Oh, that's definitely an AK-47. Everyone who's been to a range knows that sound. It's distinctive. It's, you can tell for sure. Even though the police reports say he, Garrett Foster didn't fire his weapon, witnesses say he didn't fire his weapon. And now there's videos emerged that show that the muzzle flashes are coming from the car. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, there's still a lot of misinformation out there. So the, the reason this post was so contentious um, is because the perception from a lot of people in the liberty community, the conservative community, um, and, and the gunning community is frankly that, yes, Garrett 
Foster was the aggressor here and that uh, driver of that car uh, was defending himself justly. Um, and so, you know, if, the, and, and if that is the case, if Garrett Foster was the aggressor, then, then they are correct. If on the other hand, the, the car driver was the aggressor, then, you know, we ought to maybe have some sympathy for Garrett Foster. So that's where we're at. And so I thought it would be interesting to talk about how we would figure out who is in the right and who is in the wrong here. What information would we need to know to make up our mind? Because I've, been, I've basically remained silent on this issue. You know, I think it's tragic for sure that this guy was gunned down. Um, you know, it seems like something that could have been avoidable uh, on both sides uh, of this issue. And I just think, you know, it's tragic all around. And I don't know who was in the right or who was in the wrong yet. I just don't have enough information. Um, so I thought I'd lay out some of the facts as, as I've seen them. And, and then we can talk about what we know, what we don't know, and what we would maybe need to know to render a kind of a moral judgment, I guess, on this issue. Sound fair to you? Do you have any questions or? Yeah, that sounds fair. I mean, I have my I have my response already in terms of like the way I think about it. Um, okay. But I'm wondering, do you want to go into that first, or do you want to also go into kind of like the backlash and like how it's difficult to talk about it? Because to me, I think we can do that later. I, I'd like to talk about your your initial thoughts about how you you want to think about this issue. Well, to me, it's the exact same situation we talked about, I think, about Ahmed Arbery, right? Was that right, the right. guy, there was two big guys with the gun, and it was lit with the guns kind of tracking him, and then yeah. he attacked them, and then they shot him, right? right. And the, the fundamental question was, who's the aggressor in that situation? Yeah. Is the gun a threat? Is the showing of like a, a gun a threat? If it's not, right. Ahmed Arbery was at fault. He aggressed, He was the aggressor. If it was, then he was acting in self-defense, right? right. Um, not them. And so fundamentally, the question comes down to, is the brandishing of a weapon a threat? Is it an initiation yeah. of force? Um, and right. I don't know the answer, but it's the same. It seems like that's a very important question, I suppose, yeah. right? And I, yeah. because I'm, I'm guessing it comes up a lot in the States then, right? And that's why, you know, some right. people say, no one should have any weapons because, you know, if I, if it's an open carry, someone could just have a gun and you could feel threatened or does it have to be held in their hand? Can it be pointed at you or what if it's pointed right. sideways? At what yeah. point, what's the threshold of that gun is now a threat? That's a very specific sure. question, but that's to me, you know, yep. the crux of well, the Well, and, and it's, and, and it might even be before that gun, like, you know, the, the driver's, claim that um, Garrett was pointing the, the gun at him. Okay. Well, if, if he was mm. pointing the gun at him, then it That's seems pretty clear. Yeah. But the, the video evidence and the eyewitnesses seem to show that the, the gun was what they call in the low ready position. So his arm was kind of up, the barrel was pointed okay, down, yeah. but it's the low ready position. It's like he's ready I, for action, but he hasn't raised it to initiate action yet. I right, so, but, consider that as being pointed at me personally, because the whole idea is yeah. I can't wait for him. That's just his decision. He can point and shoot as quickly as he can, or almost as quickly as he can shoot. If he is clearly in a ready to fight position with a lethal weapon, to me, mm -hmm. that is a threat to my life. I'm not going to like, right. or otherwise I'm betting that, oh, he's pulling it, right? Right now, here's some more information, though, right? Um, because was was Garrett Foster uh, responding to an initiation of, of force? Um, and right. so let me give you some background on that. This driver, according to the video, uh, ran a red light, turned right on a red light, and accelerated uh, into this crowd of people that was marching down the street. And from what I could see people, now, or what's that? Did he hit people or it's just like there was? I, I don't think so. It wasn't, it wasn't clear that he hit people, but I, the, the video shows people kind of starting to scream when this car turned into them uh, on the red light. And, you know, the driver's story is that people then surrounded his car and he, and were, were banging on it and he feared for his life. And then obviously the sky came up now, you know, yeah. it happened very quickly. If you watch the video, it's probably a matter of seconds before he starts firing on people. Um, so, you know, uh, so, so he, he turned right into this crowd. Now they, 
the, the other confounding factor here is that had they been just walking across the crosswalk, right? Like had it been a crowd of people that were walking across that crosswalk, um, it, the driver clearly to me would be the aggressor here. Uh, what makes it a little bit more tricky is that this crowd was actually marching down the street and they were just happened to be cro passing over the crosswalk. So I'm not sure like Garrett, Garrett Foster was with his girlfriend who is a, a quadruple amputee. Uh, like I guess they've been together 11 years and he stood, he was behind her. And then when this car pulled in um, fairly close to his fiance, he came around her between the car and his fiance with his gun at the low ready position. And this, this driver fired at him through the open window five times. <clears throat> Um, so that makes it a little bit trickier, right? Because, yeah. you know, I think Garrett Foster in his mind is protecting his, his girl, protecting the people there by like being ready with his gun because this driver seems to be doing something aggressive. Um, but I could also kind of understand the driver's predicament of I'm surrounded by a mob. Now I've actually been surrounded by a mob twice in my life that a violent mob in my vehicle. One just happened one time it happened that I was just, had the wrong skin color at the wrong place at the wrong time. And these guys were looking to kill a white boy and they surrounded my car and started banging it, trying to smash out the window. And I managed to, to, to pull out of there. Uh, it's not, it's like you, you've got no defense against the mob. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this guy, you know, he's, he's clearly in an area where there's protests and marching going on. He had his window down. So to me, his windows down and his guns like, must have been sitting on his lap or really handy. So he must have been, you know, evidence, evidence may show that he was there looking for trouble. Uh, right. And, and he was just looking for an excuse to open up on these people. Who knows? Uh, these are all the info, all, all the facts that I would really need to know before I pass judgment. Uh, right now, right. the way I look at it is I, I can see, I can see both sides of it, uh, you know, and I think both, people Garrett and this driver made like the most charitable thing you could say, I think is that they both made errors in judgment. Like a, you shouldn't yeah. be, why would you be running a red light into a crowd with your window open and your gun handy? Why would you even be in that area? Like, it's not like you're, you're driving home from work. It's, you know, later at night, um, you know, maybe he had a legitimate reason for being in that area, but you know, seems to me maybe he was looking for trouble, but maybe Garrett was also kind of looking for trouble. There's, there was some videos of him emerged that said, um, you know, he would never get in a gunfight with police uh, because he'd get killed. But, uh, and he said, people that want to stop us are too much, too, pus too much of a pussies to stop us or something like that kind of implying that, you know, he would, you know, so, so he, he kind of gave the impression that he was looking for trouble a little bit too. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about it. I think, well, so I think it's I, tragic. I think, you know, to me, it's, it's good reminder. Like my kids, I, I, I don't want to see them engage in these kinds of late night protests, um, marching around, blocking traffic. I understand, you know, the other, the other thing to think about here is why are these people being allowed to march in the middle of the street? Um, what, why, where are the police? Why aren't they doing something about this? Because obviously at some point motorists are going to get, and we've seen all the videos of motorists getting surrounded by mobs, making a wrong turn and, and then panicking when the mob turns on them and then driving fast and trying to get out of there and maybe running people over and stuff in their, their attempt to escape danger. Right. And you, you got to sympathize with those drivers. I mean, you can't have this, this, um, chaos in the streets and not expect things like this, I guess, to happen. And, and the police are totally failing here. Yeah. So I have four points. We'll see if I can hold on to all of them. Only one okay. is actually related to the incident directly and two are related to politics generally. And one is me trying to give you therapy about these types of things overall and, uh, oh, and, yes. Thank well, you. and how our approach, how is very different. Um, right. So the one point that I think is really valid is, yeah, I hadn't even thought he could have felt he was threatened. And so he was uh, the guy who died. So he was in the low ready position as a readiness for defense. Right. Yep. And so that's, you know, I didn't give him the benefit of that doubt. 
which I think is a really important point. You can have a defensive position in the same way you could have an aggressive position or a, like ready to be aggressive position. And so I think mm -hmm. that's an important point. Um, you know, I think the two things that come to mind politically, right, is this is clearly an issue of gun rights generally, right? And this is, it's important to figure out exactly what the proper relationship for a society and for an individual with their guns is. And that's a conversation we're not being allowed to have at all because either all guns are bad or all guns are good. And we can't get into the actual nuance of any of the gun issues. And like, that's fundamentally what's always going to be at stake or at play in these conversations. We can't know unless we have some way to objectively think about, well, what do we think is the proper relationship with guns? And I don't have enough information for that. And the culture doesn't really talk about it, right? And so yeah. that's um, an important point. And I think what you said about like the protests themselves, right? In a proper society, this would be on someone's private property, right? And yeah. so they'd either be allowing the protests and protecting like anti-protest or whatever, or they wouldn't be, right? This idea that the public that the public owns it or the government owns it and controls it and then doesn't like mediate it at all. And it's just like anarchy within the government owned spaces or whatever, and anyone can do whatever they want until some random time at which arbitrarily the government steps in. It just creates chaos and it enables these sorts of situations. But if it was all privately owned, if we had a properly structured rational society, this would not happen. This could not happen or it would happen a lot less because, you know, we'd be very clear. We'd very clearly know who was in the right to even be there. If the protesters, if yeah. the protesters have a right to be there and this guy is not using the road properly and is threatening the protesters who actually have a right to be there, then he's at fault from the very beginning by driving yeah. that way, right? But if he's just an irate motorist and why are, the, why are the protesters in my way? I'm trying to get to work. And like you said, lots of people are having that situation. Um, then he's in the right. And we can't know because the government has no rules, no terms. They're just kind of letting people do whatever they want. I don't know if you want to comment on that before I then go to my therapeutic meta point, but. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the only thing I'll say is that, um, you know, if, if we just are using the rules of the road um, as, as a guideline here, like if, if someone blows a red light and, and nearly hits my wife, <laughs> you know, and, and stop, like, is clearly in the wrong. Uh, I could see why, like, I, I would step in front and be like very aggressive with that person and in protecting I, my family. You right? draw a weapon and you, uh, I, draw if, a weapon, if, like, you know what, if I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, if I like, I mean, here's the thing. I saw pictures of him holding this gun, right. And it's strapped to his chest like this and his arms up like this when he's walking around. And it looked like that's yeah. the position he was in at right. the time he got shot. So I don't know that he changed positions necessarily, but I could see how that would look very right. aggressive, right? If I had a gun, if I was yeah. carrying a gun, I might be, co be covering my holster as, as I You're got in front yeah. of my wife in this vehicle. Cause I don't know what this guy's going to do. If he ran a red light and kind of came in aggressively and there's a, a bunch of other people that he seems to be disregarding, and I'm not sure what's about to happen. Of like, yeah. You know, and I'm in Texas where hate what I'm here for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and there, are, and I'm in Texas where guns are, are everyone's packing, you know, I'm, I'm suspecting this guy may also be packing. I mean, I could see where he would uh, do that. Um, yeah. So, so I, I mean, just strictly from that perspective, but you know, again, the confounding factors are we don't like if that guy was frightened for some reason and that's why he ran the red light, you know, like if he was surrounded by the mob or if he, there was a legitimate reason for him to be scared for his safety and he made that turn, you know, then, you know, th these are all contextual things. And, and this is why this thing needs to be tried in a court of law. If there is enough evidence to charge him and all Ooh. these facts need to be, to, to be addressed. Right. And so, so uh, yeah. So that is my therapeutic meta point. You've brought up oh, okay. there. We don't have enough evidence. There's new stuff coming out every day. How do we make proper judgment? You know, this needs to be tried in a court of law. That is what we need to, that's what I do. And that's what we as a culture need to get back to. And I think right. it would help you be calmer and less anxious and less if less plugged out if sure. 
we weren't trying to figure this out all of the time when it happens, right? Because this is an extremely complex situation. It could be months in court of lawyers and discovery and judgments and testimony to actually know what happened, who's in the right, who's in the wrong is a very complex issue. And, but what we do is it's trial by social media now, right? Yes. Not innocent until proven guilty or whatever, right? And so to try and work through it live as more evidence comes up, as this gets posted, that get, gets posted, it's just not worth it for me because there's no actual ability. We're kind of just like playing a, a like an intellectual game, but there's no yeah. way we could possibly come to a conclusion in 30 minutes. Um, right, especially right. But so- I, I think it's a good exercise to go through what uh, what would proper justice look like, right? What What would the facts be that would matter in this case? Like, uh, in a proper like, objectivist or libertarian court trying to figure out, you know, the, the, the key issue would be who was the initiator of the violence here, right? Right. And, and, and these and are all the facts. Point, but, but that's the point I highlighted right away. This is very similar to the Ahmed Arbery case. Yep. It literally comes down to who initiated the force. And like, that's the only principle that we can figure out. And then it's just discovery and it's how much information can we get to actually make the right determination of that. And that is the thing that people are obsessive about. And most people, I mean, don't care because they just want to pick their side, but that's like an intense legal specialty, right? Like for us to actually be able to come to that determination takes all of the, if we're trying to do it properly, takes all of the evidence, a lot of time, a lot of thought. And so I think, like, that's why I'm not plugged into those sort of things because yeah. like, yeah, it's a crime that happened or allegedly ha- or an alleged crime or whatever. Um, and it would be nearly impossible for me to actually figure out the right answer until the courts adjudicate it. And then I can look at all of the evidence the courts collected and I can see, do I agree with their decision or not? But to try and do it beforehand, and that's like there's this tendency in the culture now, and especially with social media, to try and figure out the verdict. And so even though you and I aren't tribal, even you and not, even though you and I are trying to actually find the right answer, the impulse to try and need to find it as quickly as everyone else, like that's a different game they're playing, right? It's easy for them to know who's right and wrong. For you and I to know who's right or wrong, it takes months, right? It, it doesn't take uh, a day or whatever. So that's my, my view of it, at least. Yeah, no. And, you know, if like, you know, I'm not losing any sleep over this. If I'm anxious, Mm -hmm. it's because, um, I didn't mean to say you're anxious, but no, 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 no. But I I am anxious talking about this because it is such a contentious issue. It's, I, I think it's important for us to address these, um, issues that are in the media cycle and, and try to help people think about these things clearly. Right. Um, and, and you know, the thing, the thing is that people are a hundred percent sure right away. Right. And right. It, they, they either start parroting Fox news, talking points, talking about how this leftist uh, BLM sympathizer uh, opened fire on this innocent driver, or they they're touting CNN talking points that, that, uh, you know, this uh, driver went out looking for trouble and, and um, you know, Garrett Foster was a hero standing up for black lives and, and doing all, you know, so he's either a hero or a villain. And here are your talking points as given to you by the media and not just the mainstream right. media, but a lot of it is from the alt media, right? Who yeah. are, who don't do any kind of investigative reporting. They already have their narrative of, BLM bad, uh, right wing good, or vice yeah. versa. And I'm going to cr- make the narrative fit my preconceived notions. And then they feed out information that fits their thing, right. even if that information is wrong. And we know it's wrong that Garrett Foster fired. He didn't fire. So that right away just dis- should discount your. So, so we need to get rid of these narratives and think more clearly about this, these issues. Right. But I'm saying that the only way to think more clearly is to let the actual process happen. Right. So this comes back to let's build buildings, not fight fires. Right. And so like you said at the start, how I'm just kind of in my own world, I'm not plugged into this stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah, because the actual proper approach for anyone rational and calm is 
well, I can't make a decision yet. There's no chance, right? Yeah. So yeah, I understand that everyone's trying to figure out what's right or wrong. And I should, I'm the rational man. I should go in and say, hey, everyone, actually, we just have no idea, right? And like, as if that's going to help them realize or help some people, but actually maybe, I, and I do think there's value. Like if someone's watching this and sees, okay, actually I just shouldn't make an opinion yet because there's a lot of information, right. you know, here's the kind of key issue at stake. Um, I do think there's value in that, but I think the mentality of like, no, we really need to figure out what's the right answer right now. It's impossible. And so what I focus on is instead, no, let the media cycle happen and engage in your interests generally, but focus on other stuff, right? Focus on what yep. you can be building um, because you like, yeah, to be the, to be trying to insert rationality into that conversation is impossible, literally, yeah. because all you can say is, well, we just don't know enough to be rational yet. We don't know enough right. to be objective yet. But it's, 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 not, it's still a worthwhile endeavor to talk about, okay, let's look at this through the lens of justice and, and the principles of justice, right? And the, you know, what we need to know is who initiated force and who was using protective force. And that requires a lot of context and a lot of detail that we just but, don't know yet. Um, yeah. So let's wait for that to come in because, we, you know, we can't, we can't determine justice just because we hate BLM or we hate right wing people, um, you know, and that's, that's how a lot of people are doing. And, and I know our audience is smart enough to do this, to, to not like jump onto a side, one side or the other without having all the facts, but a lot of people aren't. And, and some people that are kind of on the fence are swayed by very strong opinions. You know, like one of the things that actually gives me anxiety a little bit is that everyone else is so cocksure of their opinion. They know that they're on the hundred percent on the side of right. And I'm like, what do they know that I don't know? Maybe I'm missing something here. Am I missing something? Wow. And, and so that, that kind of worries me a little bit sometimes, but then right. I realize no, I'm just, you know, you know, I, I just like to think through these issues and not just jump bandwagon jump immediately. Right. And so I, I, I mean, we've, we've talked before about how we have a difference of approach, right? But I think, you know, to me, what comes to mind as to what would be more valuable then in this case is, you know, we find an already adjudicated similar case and talk about the details of that and why that decision made yeah. sense and was just, right? Because then that yeah. actually helps people as this unfolds, as new information comes up, have a comparison, right? Like that's right, the right. type of thing that I would do that would help people rather than just saying, well, well, this, that we don't know, like, unless you're kind of able to do an up-to-date following of a case, because that's the other thing. If, if we were following the case and helping people contextualize it, and that was the plan, that's different. Because then you can say, oh, well, here's how I think about this as it unfolds. But to do like a one-time shot is also like, well, here's the evidence in this current second and here's the principle. And okay, eventually we'll have to combine the two and figure out, you know, who's at fault based on the evidence. But if yeah. you actually, you know, this new piece of evidence and you do a longer kind of dive into it, because I do think that's important Right. Um, but, but, I, but the point here isn't to, to like my, my point of doing this podcast isn't to try to figure out who's guilty or innocent. My point here is to, um, is to say it's not as simple as these few facts we have. Like we can't determine justice just based on these few facts. We need more facts and we need to apply them then to these principles, right? It's these principles that matter. Uh, yeah. These are the principles of justice and we don't know all the facts to, to make that decision yet. So, um, you know, I, th I think that's my point here um, is, is to just calm, you know, people calm your tits a little bit. Now, if, if, right. if our and audience, so if our, uh, hold on, if, if our audience wants us to do a bunch of legal research and try to determine the guilt and innocent based on, you know, look yeah. at previous cases, guys, send us some donations. We're happy to do that. We'll put in the time and do the research and do some legal research and, and find out past case law. That's not really what I'm interested in doing. I don't think you're necessarily interested in doing that. Um, okay. You know, I, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not sure, like, I don't, I didn't know Garrett Foster. I, you know, I think it's tragic that he died. I think it's tragic that this driver is now being investigated. I, I think pe mistakes were made, um, but that's about all. I, I just think it's a whole tragic uh, instance 
from what I heard, Garrett seems like he, he was a good guy and it's tragic that we lost a life. And, you know, it looks like mistakes were made uh, and, and, you know, a, a guy's dead. I didn't know them though. And that's about as far as I'm ever going to take this case, you know, uh, right. look into and this so... is maybe a year from now when we get a verdict and all, all the facts come out, it'll be worth a revisit. But until uh, then, uh, you know, I'm not going to worry about um, this case anymore. You know what I mean? Right. That's fair. And so that's, I think this gets to the, the, the fundamental kind of question I have about what is the, the point of discussing it then. And I'm not saying it's pointless because yeah. I'm, I'm, no. I'm really interested in this because to me, it's like we, the principle is who initiated force. You know, this is a tragic thing anyways, and we really don't have enough information to make a decision. And to me, every time one of these things comes up, essentially those are the three principles. And to me, it's like banging my head against the wall. Yeah. And I don't like my assumption is our audience already knows that and doesn't need us to remind them, but it could be that no, some people are finding this and then they get the message that that's, Oh, they happen to be interested in this case and we tell them, Oh, well, this is the same answer again. And so that's, you know, it's well, a matter of who's finding us. Because right. to me, you know, the rational people who are watching this probably already know what we're telling them. Maybe it's nice to remind them, but how many people who are kind of jumping to conclusions are finding us this time and getting the rational message? So that, that's an yeah. interesting well, thing. And well, I've not thought of it from kind no, of your well, but, but here's that. the thing, you know, you're, you're telling me that we're preaching to the choir and I'm saying, yes, we are preaching to the choir. That's our job is to preach to the choir. It's to invigorate no, them. It's I to, disagree. it's to back up their arguments. It's to, to give them, to articulate, um, things that they might be having difficult art difficulty articulating. Um, and you know, you know, if, if our goal was to, let's say, get new members, what we would be doing is, or, or be, be preaching to like, you, you know, if, if we're trying to attract uh, a mainstream audience, uh, we would be, we would have to approach this podcast in a much different way, right? It would mm-hmm. have to start with a provocative headline, you know, was blah, blah, blah. And that are the surprising facts and debunking the myths and like all these flashy the truth things. about the, the truth. foster killing what pisses me off about, you know, and, and then yeah. we drag in people in, we do a quick uh, pithy video with some superficial talking points and try to drive follow, followers. But what we're doing here is not that this is church and we're doing a theological sermon to people that know this stuff, but often need, you know, it, it, like it's not just reminding them, but it's, it's fleshing out, um, how we can think about this because there's always temptation out there, David, we're tempted by the world. We're tempted to be drawn into a tribe. I even feel it. It's like, I want, you know, I feel the pull. I'm like, Oh, I want to be on this time. Oh, but these guys are making a point. Oh, I don't know which one to be on. And then I realize, Oh, you know what? I don't need to be in a point. Let's get back to my principles here. Let's be my own free thinker. And I have to believe that a lot of our audience members are in the same boat. It's like, ah, I don't know which way to go. Or maybe I, I bandwagon jump prematurely and you know, David and Tim are reminding me that I don't need to be on that bandwagon that I can back up and, and think about this from a, a rational perspective. So we're just promoting rationality with people that value rationality. And I think that's still a good thing and worthwhile. Yeah, I know that's valid. That does help me clarify, uh, you know, the purpose of, of these sorts of things, because to me, I suppose it, it becomes pretty clear what kind of, that, that it's like a similar principle, but I suppose, um, you know, it is a complex situation and, and, the, and people don't think of it a lot, right? And, and so to help kind of ground, okay, here's what everyone's saying and here's how we come back to grounding it in objectivity and why we really can't make a decision yet. And that's okay that we can't make a decision yet. It's okay that we can't like, you know, join a team and say if someone's guilty or innocent, right? Um, so that makes sense. Cool. I think we've be, we've beaten this one to death. Hey, send me you know when we're recording. All right, so today we are going to talk about uh, the most divisive issue right now, the latest most divisive issue that's sweeping through libertarian circles. I mean, we can't get away from the divisiveness. 